Our next speaker is Matthew J. Grow. Matthew is Director of Publications at the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a general editor of the Joseph Smith Papers. He leads a team of 40 historians, editors, and web specialists creating historical publications for academic and popular audiences. His newest book, which is part of the Joseph Smith Papers and about which he is going to speak today, is Council of 50 Minutes, March 1844 through January 1846, written with uh, co-editors Ronald Esplin, Mark Ashurst McGee, is that Jarek Dirkmat? Garrick, excuse me, Garrick Dirkmat, I should have asked before I came up here, and Jeffrey Mayhas. This is due out in September of 2016. I believe he has a pre-publication version in his hands, and I will try to steal that from him on my way down. He is also co-author of the first 50 years of Relief Society, key documents in Latter-day Saint women's history, which we have copies in the bookstore, I believe, co-authored with Jill Durr, Carol Madsen, and Kate Holbrook. In 2015, he authored The Prophet and the Reformer, Letters of Brigham Young and Thomas L. Cain, with co-author Ronald W. Walker. Previous books include award-winning biographies of Parley P. Pratt, written with Terrell Givens, and also a book on Thomas L. Cain. He received his PhD in American History from the University of Notre Dame in 2006. Matthew Groh. Thanks, Mike. I'm flattered that you would choose me over a five minute break. <laughs> it's my privilege today to provide a sneak peek uh, into a book that will be released to the public in about five weeks. We actually received the first of the books off the printing press just a few days ago. It's the latest volume in the Joseph Smith papers the Minutes of the Council of Fifty in Nauvoo, Illinois. For those not familiar with the Council, it met regularly from March 1844, when it was founded by Joseph Smith, until January 1846, right before the exodus from Nauvoo. The publication of these minutes is another step in the Joseph Smith paper's ongoing efforts to publish all of his papers. Because the minutes have never been open to research, the Council of Fifty has been the subject of tremendous speculation over the years. The views expressed in the Council Minutes represent the thinking of church leaders in the mid-1840s, a particularly turbulent time in both Mormon and American history. They don't represent necessarily what the church teaches today about topics such as theocracy. Today, of course, the church makes every effort to be politically neutral even during the past presidential election featuring a church member. The contents of these minutes remind us of another era in which the church was decidedly not politically neutral. First, let's give a little history of the minutes themselves. William Clayton, an English convert who began clerical work for Joseph Smith in 1842, was appointed clerk of the council during its first meeting. He kept meeting minutes on loose sheets of paper and later copied these minutes into three small bound volumes. In their deliberation, council members frequently emphasized the importance of confidentiality, including the need to safeguard these minutes. Willard Richards slightly kept the identity secret by referring to the council as YTFIF in Joseph Smith's journal, a code that perhaps could be broken. They almost certainly believed that knowledge of their discussions regarding theocracy in the kingdom of God would increase the already widespread belief that Latter-day Saints opposed key elements of American democracy. On the night of June 22, 1844, knowing that he would soon be en route to Carthage, Joseph Smith sent for Clayton and ordered him to burn up the records, of, to burn the records of the kingdom, or put them in some safe hands and send them away, or else bury them up. Clayton went home that night, put the records in a small box, and buried them in his garden. We're grateful he chose that option, not the burning one. On July 3rd, 1844, shortly after Joseph's death, 
Clayton unburied the minutes, and he soon began copying these loose sheets of papers into the first of these small volumes. Following the exodus from Nauvoo, the minutes were taken to Utah. They were used in the 1850s uh, when the manuscript history of the church was written, and some of them were used uh, in publications such as the Deseret News. But even so, the original, the original minutes continued to be closely guarded. By 1880, George Q. Cannon was clerk of the council. He had possession of the key to the box containing records of the kingdom of God. He was then in Congress, and he mailed the key back to Salt Lake City so that John Taylor, then president of the Quorum of the Twelve, and his fellow apostles, Joseph F. Smith and Franklin D. Richards, could read the minutes in preparation for a reconstitution of the council. When George Q. Cannon wrote of the Council of 50 in his journal or in his letters to Joseph F. Smith, he used another code, using the Hawaiian word for 50 to conceal what he was talking about. Probably a little bit more effective than Willard Richards. At some point thereafter, the minutes became part of the collection of the, of the First Presidency where they remained throughout the 20th and early 21st centuries until they were transferred to the Church History Department's collections in 2010. In 2013, the Church announced that the First Presidency had authorized publication of the minutes. Since that time, a team of historians, including myself, Ron Esplin, Mark Ashers McGee, Garrett Dirkmod, and Jeff Mayhaas, have worked on the minutes, along with the Joseph Smith Papers' excellent editorial team led by Eric Smith. We're excited that in just a few weeks, anyone who has wanted to speculate or wanted to know anything about the minutes or the Council of 50 can do so in great detail. And I'll just say that these minutes aren't like a lot of 19th century minutes that are difficult to read. William Clayton writes in complete sentences here. They're, they're, they, they flow, they're easy to read, uh, they're really terrific. Let me show you a few more pictures. Here's the title page. Record of the Council of 50 or the Kingdom of God, 1844. The rest of the writing there is an index that was made later on. Here's the first page. The council was organized on the strength of the contents of two letters from the brethren in the pine country. Talk about that in a minute. Oh, okay. They made a list of the members of the council. Number one, President Joseph Smith, standing chairman. Number two, Samuel Bent, born 1775. Number three, John Smith, born 1781. They organized themselves in the council according to age, except for Joseph Smith, who was the standing chairman. The list continues. So when and why was the council established? In March 1844, Joseph Smith received two letters from the Brethren in the Pine Country, men who had been sent to the Wisconsin Pineries to gather lumber for the Nauvoo Temple and the Nauvoo House. As they finished, they wrote him letters and said, perhaps we should be sent not to Nauvoo when we return, but to somewhere else to help establish the kingdom of God, to explore new settlements. And so Joseph Smith convened a council. This brought together thoughts that he'd already been having. And the minutes record that in that initial council meeting, all seemed agreed to look to some place where we can go and establish a theocracy, either in Texas or in Oregon or somewhere in California. Why were church leaders so enthusiastic about the proposal to establish a new settlement. And what do Texas, Oregon, and California have in common? They were outside the boundaries of the United States. Why did they want to form a new kind of government? The, perhaps the primary reason is the persecution the saints had experienced in Missouri in the 1830s driven from Jackson County in 1833 and then completely expelled from the state in 1838-39, a 
under order of the Missouri governor. Repeated attempts by the saints to secure protection and redress through legal means were largely unsuccessful. These experiences left them deeply convinced of the inability and unwillingness of governments to protect the rights of unpopular religious minorities. At this time, the United States Bill of Rights protected it against abuses by only the federal government, not state and local governments, meaning that federal officials refused to intervene to protect rights at local levels. Like abolitionists and members of other maligned movements who had suffered at the hands of majority opinion, Latter-day Saints sought changes that would restore what they saw as a proper balance to America's political system. Joseph Smith and others had designed the government of the city of Nauvoo to provide protections the Latter-day Saints had lacked during the 1830s. The Nauvoo Municipal Charter, granted by the state of Illinois in 1840, was intended to guard against many of the institutional wrongs the saints had experienced. For example, the charter authorized the creation of a separate militia, the Nauvoo Legion, and gave the Nauvoo City Court far-reaching authority, which the saints had used to protect themselves from what they perceived as unjust legal actions. After failing to receive assurances from the expected main candidates in the upcoming presidential election in 1844, the, the saints' rights would be protected, Joseph Smith declared his candidacy for president of the United States. His platform emphasized, as do his remarks in the Council of Fifty, a commitment to protect the minority rights of all, not just Latter-day Saints, against what they saw as the tyranny of the majority. By March of that year, significant opposition was growing to the church in and around Nauvoo in part because of the practice of plural marriage and the saints' growing political power. Members of the council were, were drawn both to the possibility of relocating significant numbers of the saints outside of the United States, where they could create their own government, and to the possibility of creating a better government in the United States. They discussed at length the nature of the kingdom of God, theocracy, and Joseph Smith's role as leader of the church and council. Now for most contemporary Americans, theocracy connoted the tyrannical rule of religious leaders. Conjured images of the collusion of Catholicism with European governments and seemed the opposite of American democracy. However, Joseph Smith and other council members believed that theocracy could be fused with the best elements of democracy, a system that he publicly described during his campaign for the presidency as theodemocracy. He said, I go emphatically, virtuously, and humanely for a theodemocracy, where God and the people hold the power to conduct the affairs of men in righteousness. He said that this would protect liberty and freedom for the benefit of all. Council members reiterated that a system that blended theocracy with democracy would protect the rights of minority groups, allow for dissent and free discussion, involve Latter-day Saints and others in hopes of increasing righteousness in preparation for Christ's second coming. Sidney Rigdon stated, the design was to form a theocracy according to the will of heaven planted without any intention to interfere with any government in the world. You need not fear that we design to trample on the rights of any man or set of men, only to seek the enjoyment of our own rights. Joseph Smith likewise considered that a theocracy consisted in our exercising all the intelligence of the council and bringing forth all the light which dwells in the breast of every man. Theocracy is for the people to get the voice of God and then acknowledge it and to see it executed. Joseph Smith and other members of the Council of Fifty believed that the council would serve as the government of the kingdom of God both before and after the second coming of Jesus Christ. In their view, not all good men and women, either before the second coming or after, would be church members. They emphasized that everyone would enjoy religious liberty in, in the kingdom of God. 
Joseph Smith invited three men who were not members of the church to join the council to demonstrate the importance of religious liberty and equal rights to the council. Council members also attempted to write a constitution for the kingdom of God that would reflect these principles of theodemocracy. The council's name, which was given in a revelation during the council meeting, suggests a mix of political purpose and religious symbolism. The kingdom of God and his laws, with the keys and power thereof, and judgment in the hands of his servant and the hands of his servants. Council members often used an abbreviated form of this revealed name, referring to the council by such titles as the kingdom, the kingdom of God, or council of the kingdom of God. After the council reached a membership of 50 men, Joseph Smith declared that it was full, and then it got the nickname of Council of 50. It was on the day of the, of the council's organization that Joseph Smith appointed four men to draft a constitution for the, for the council which would be perfect and embrace those principles which the Constitution of the United States lacked. They criticized the U.S. Constitution for not protecting liberty with enough vigor. The initial month and a half of this council, this committee repeatedly gives a report of their Constitution writing. They began by imitating the United States Constitution, we the people of the kingdom of God. But they also were clearly not making very good pro progress. This was a difficult task. Finally, after the council, after the committee uh, brought forth a half-ranked constitution, Joseph Smith told them to let the constitution alone. He then dictated a revelation in the council, verily thus saith the Lord, ye are my constitution and I am your God and ye are my spokesman. From henceforth, do as I shall command you, saith the Lord. In the midst of these discussions on governmental principles in the kingdom of God, Erastus Snow, in April 1844, moved that the council... Oh yeah, where this will be. Moved that the council receive from this time henceforth Joseph Smith as our prophet, priest, and king. Snow's motion was unanimously accepted. This action dramatically demonstrates the council members' views of theodemocracy under which the ecclesiastical leader of the church, the prophet and priest, would be chosen by them as a political leader, king. Council participants understood that the action would have no immediate political consequences, but it symbolized their desire to prepare for the millennial kingdom of God. Proclaiming Joseph Smith as a prophet, priest, and king also reflected the temple ceremonies that he had introduced among the, his closest followers in the previous two years. In the view of Latter-day Saints, these ceremonies would allow men to one day become, in the words of John the Revelator, unto our God, kings and priests. In July 1843, Joseph Smith taught that he would advance from prophet to priest and then to king, not to the kingdoms of this earth, but of the Most High. On April 8, 1844, a few days before the council received him as prophet, priest, and king, Joseph Smith urged the saints to finish building the Nauvoo Temple so that they could there receive their endowment to make them kings and priests unto the Most High God. He explained that this had nothing to do with temporal things, but was instead related to the kingdom of God. The beliefs that Joseph Smith had crowned himself king of an earthly theocracy spread among both dissidents within the church and opponents and observers outside the church. The accusations are in the Nauvoo Expositor, the newspaper published a few, months before, a few weeks before his uh, death that accused him of attempting to establish a theocracy. So common were rumors. In the summer of 1844, the Illinois governor, Thomas Ford, placed the belief that Smith had caused himself to be crowned and anointed king of the Mormons first in a list of causes of excitement that led to Joseph's death. Some surely expect that there would be a description of a coronation in which Joseph crowned himself king of the world in the council of 50 minutes. Not so. Rather, his associates received him with the religious language of prophet, priest, and king. 
The establishment of the council also reflected Latter-day Saints' interest in American Indians and in the West. As early as 1831, when federal Indian agents denied permission to the four initial Mormon missionaries sent to preach to Indians in what is now Kansas, the missionaries contemplated taking their message to the Rocky Mountains, if necessary, in order to be with the Indians. The Mormon interest in American Indians and in the West framed many of the council's discussions. As tensions grew in Nauvoo, the saints' long-standing interest in the West gained urgency. The West had already figured in the American imagination as a place of refuge and redefinition. A year before, newspaper editor John O'Sullivan proclaimed it the manifest destiny of the United States to spread across the continent. The saints were contemplating these new settlements in California and Oregon and Texas. Joseph wanted them to be able to go to a new place, to build a city in a day and have a government of our own in a healthy climate. In addition, biblical prophecies and Joseph Smith's revelations established the context for Latter-day Saint thinking on the kingdom of God. Council members emphasized the prophecy in Daniel that God would set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, which shall be as a stone cut out of the mountain without hands that would fill the earth. Latter-day Saints did not believe that they were simply creating another denomination within the ranks of Christianity. Rather, they believed that Daniel's prophecy referred to the Latter-day Church and Kingdom of God. Several of Joseph Smith's revelations spoke of the Kingdom of God and contributed to the eventual establishment of the Council of Fifty. Early revelations commanded converts to seek the Kingdom of God. In October 1831, Revelation, paraphrasing Daniel, declared the keys of the kingdom of God is committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth, as the stone which is hewn from the mountain without hands shall roll forth until it hath filled the whole earth. Initially, Latter-day Saints likely understood these statements about the kingdom of God as describing the work of the church. By the time of the organization of the Council of Fifty, Joseph Smith and others saw them as referring to a literal kingdom of God on earth. Joseph Smith had been publicly expressing similar thoughts on the merits of a theocracy since 1842, when an editorial on the government of God appeared in the Times and Seasons, the Nauvoo newspaper. The editorial, written by John Taylor, criticized contemporary governments for their failure to promote universal peace and happiness including the United States government. Speaking about the government of God as reflected in ancient Israel and in the future millennium, the editorial said their government was a theocracy. They had God to make their laws and men chosen by him to administer them. So will it be when the purposes of God shall be accomplished, when the Lord shall be king over the whole earth and Jerusalem his throne. Members of the council believed that it would play a role in the fulfillment of these biblical and latter-day prophecies. Hiram Smith told the council that the time was at hand when the prophecy should be fulfilled, when the nations were ready to embrace the gospel, and when the ensign should be lifted up and, the standard, and be the standard to the people. So how did the church and the council relate to each other in their minds? Though general and local church members were key members of the council, the council was not seen as an ecclesiastical body. The first presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, and other church quorums and councils continued to function as normal and continued to be responsible for the ecclesiastical matters, such as appointing church officers, disciplining members, teaching doctrine, and performing ordinances. The council in 50, in contrast, was a temporal, or a political body created to protect the church and provide its space to flourish. There's an absolutely wonderful debate in the council where Joseph Smith introduces the topic and he asks, what is the relationship between the church and the council? And the council uh, members debated it, it looks like, all day. And at the end of the debate, this is what Joseph says. And they, various people have taken different positions. It says, there is a distinction between the church of God and the kingdom of God. The laws of the kingdom are not designed to affect our salvation hereafter. It is an entire, distinct, and separate government. The church is a spiritual matter and a spiritual kingdom. 
But the kingdom which Daniel saw was not a spiritual kingdom, but was designed to be got up for the safety and salvation of the saints by protecting them in their religious rights and worship. So, what did the council do? At a practical level, it had three main accomplishments. First, it managed Joseph Smith's presidential campaign. Second, it provided a forum for making practical decisions in Nauvoo, including about uh, the Nauvoo Temple and how to protect and govern the city after the loss of the Nauvoo Charter, after Joseph Smith's death. And third, the council played a major role in, the, in exploring possible settlement sites and in planning the church's migration to the American West. Under Brigham Young's leadership in 1845 and 1846, the council focused less on the wide-ranging discussions about millennial prophecies, the kingdom of God, and constitutionalism that had occupied it during the council's initial months. Just some fun things from the presidential campaign. Rather, council members focused on more pragmatic concerns, particularly how to govern the city of Nauvoo after the Illinois legislature revoked the Nauvoo Charter. This meant that the, that the city had no militia, it had no police force, it had no judicial system, it had no city council, and the Council of 50 steps into that void. They also continued gathering information on Western sites uh, under Brigham Young. During the Brigham Young era, of the council in 1845 and 1846, in the shadow of the murders of Joseph and Hiram Smith, and with the growing realization of the saints' tenuous situation in Nauvoo, council members occasionally lashed out in anger at their perceived enemies. Brigham Young expressed his frustration by stating that he did not care about preaching to the Gentiles any longer. Indeed, he stated, paraphrasing, paraphrasing Lyman White, let the scoundrels be killed. Let them be swept off the earth, and then we can go and be baptized for them, easier than we can convert them. <laughs> the previous treatment of the Latter-day Saints in Missouri and Illinois and the murders of the Smiths heavily influenced his rhetoric. The Gentiles have rejected the gospel. They have killed the prophets, and those who have not taken an active part in the murder all rejoice in it and say amen to it. Rather than preach to the gospel, he continued, the saints would look to the house of Israel, by which he meant the American Indians. He thought the American governments had been too powerless or too corrupt to protect the Latter-day Saints' rights, and he vowed that he would not allow himself to be killed and taken as Joseph had been. Both the Latter-day Saints and their opponents accepted widespread American attitudes toward community violence and vigilantism that justified using extra legal means to provide for community defense when other mechanisms failed, or to enforce order on individuals or communities perceived as unstable. It's in that context, and in the context of the, of the revoking of the Nauvoo Charter, and there's no police force in Nauvoo, that Brigham Young encourages uh, the formation of the whistling and whittling brigades. Bands of deacon, it's meant to patrol the city and make sure, uh, and to intimidate uh, outsiders who they thought might be causing trouble in the city. Of course, if these are lovable 12-year-olds with pocket knives, that's one image. If they're 20-year-olds with Bowie knives, that's another image. The Mormons themselves continued to be targets of extra-legal extra vigilantism after the mob murders of the Smiths, and the saints uh, themselves expelled some dissenters from Nauvoo uh, as well. Notwithstanding the often heated statements within the Council of Fifty, Mormon extralegal violence was typically limited to the defense of Nauvoo from outsiders and uh, the expulsion of dissidents from the city. When faced with the possibility of armed conflict between the saints and other Illinois residents, Young and other church leaders spoke of suffering wrong rather than doing wrong and eventually opted for a mass exodus rather than battle. So, what about the Council of 50 Minutes today? They're, of course, of interest to historians. 
They provide us terrific detail in what's often a lost period of Latter-day Saint history between the martyrdom and the Trek West. But I think there's also some things in here that will be of more wide interest. The Council of 50 Minutes provide a way of studying how church members can make decisions according to inspiration in the council process. While the council chairman, Joseph Smith of Brigham Young, directed some council discussions, the members had equal opportunity to speak. Council decisions were to be unanimous. Council members believed that they had an obligation to offer candid commentary on issues before the council and that their collective deliberations would lead them to correct and inspire decisions. From the beginning of the council, Joseph Smith urged participants to speak their minds, to say what was in their hearts, whether good or bad. He said he did not want to be surrounded forever by a set of dough heads, by which he meant, I think, yes men. And if they did not rise up and shake themselves and exercise themselves in discussing these important matters, he should consider them nothing better than dough heads. This deliberative process was followed as the council explored possible new settlement sites for the saints. Here's what the map looks like in uh, February 1844 as the council has its beginnings. Sometimes Latter-day Saints assumed that the saints knew they were headed to the Rocky Mountains uh, earlier than, than they were. So first of all, the Wisconsin Saints say, maybe we should go down to Texas. Joseph Smith and others begin planning expeditions to Oregon and California. Then the council is organized. Let's see what happens under Joseph Smith. So you remember, Oregon is disputed between U.S. and Britain. Upper California is Mexican territory, and the Republic of Texas is independent. So one of the first things the council does is send a delegate to Texas. He meets with Sam Houston and explores Mormon colonization of Texas. They send delegates to Washington, D.C. to see about the possibility of, of, of raising uh, men to protect the western frontier. The council approved plans for the Wisconsin Saints to settle in the Republic of Texas, a commission that Lyman White never forgot. Then Joseph and his brothers were killed. What happens under Brigham? Same map. The council is reorganized February 4th. The council considers various settlements, Oregon, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, or possibly among Cherokee or other Indians in the West. Then they begin to zero in on Upper California. Why? Because in March 1845, the re the Republic of Texas becomes the state of Texas. When it becomes so, they still are looking outside the boundaries of the United States. So they begin to focus their attention on the Upper California. They also send missionaries to American Indian tribes to check out possibilities there. John Taylor writes this wonderful song that is first sung, and perhaps even written during a meeting of the Council of 50. The Upper California, oh, that's the land for me. It lays between the mountains and the great Pacific Sea. The saints can be supported there and enjoy sweet liberty. With flocks and herds abounding, oh, that's the land for me. But hold on, John. They begin, they continue studying the maps, meeting with fur traders and others. Uh, and they begin to receive reports about the Rocky Mountains and specifically about the Great Salt Lake. Brigham announces his intention to settle near the Great Salt Lake, and the council begins preparations for a mass exodus from Nauvoo. And interestingly, it's only at the end of that deliberative process, after they've explored every possibility, after they've looked at every map, after they've talked with everyone they can, who knows about the West, after they've sent delegates here and there and everywhere, it's only then that Brigham Young receives a revelation of confirmation. And he says in the Council of 50, the saying of the prophets would never be verified unless the house of the Lord should be reared in the tops of the mountains, 
and the proud banner of liberty wave over the valleys that are within the mountains. And I know where the spot is, and I know how to make the flag. One other reason that I think the council minutes will be of interest, and then they go west, we know that part, is that there's just some terrific statements from Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and, and others in the Council of 50 that we've never had before. Let me just read two of these to you. This is Brigham. He supposed there has not yet been a perfect revelation given because we cannot understand it, yet we receive a little here and a little there. He should not be stumbled if the prophet should translate the Bible 40,000 times over. And yet it should be different in some places every time because when God speaks, he always speaks according to the capacity of the people. The starting point for the government of the kingdom is in the book of Doctrine and Covenants. But he does not know how much more there is in the bosom of the Almighty. When God sees that his people have enlarged upon what he has given us, he will give us more. This is a long one and probably unreadable for you, but let me read it. I'll read portions of it. He says, this is Joseph Smith on religious liberty. He argues that the agency that God gave his children requires mortals, two, to grant and safeguard the freedom of religion. He declares, God cannot save or damn a man only on the principle that every man acts, chooses, and worships for himself. Hence, the importance of thrusting from us every spirit of bigotry and intolerance towards a man's religious sentiments, that spirit which has drenched the earth in blood. When a man feels the least temptation to such intolerance, he ought to spurn it from him. It becomes our duty, on account of this intolerance and corruption, the inalienable right of man being to think as he pleases, worship as he pleases, this being the first law of everything that is sacred, to guard every ground all the days of our lives. I will appeal to every man in this council, beginning at the youngest, that when he arrives to the years of old age, he will have to say that the principles of intolerance and bigotry never had a place in this kingdom, nor in my breast, and that he is even then ready to die rather than yield to such things. Nothing can reclaim the human mind from its ignorance, bigotry, superstition, etc., but those grand and sublime principles of equal rights and universal freedom to all men. When I have used every means in my power to exalt a man's mind and have taught him righteous principles to no effect, he is still inclined in his darkness. Yet the same principles of liberty and charity would ever be manifested by me as though he embraced it. Hence, in all governments or political transactions, a man's religious opinion should never be called in question. A man should be judged by the law independent of religious prejudice. I'll let Joseph have the last word. Scott mentioned that it's only lunch afterwards, so we can take as long as we want <laughs> questions and answers. And Did Joseph Smith not understand the Council of Twelve through the Council of Fifty? Um, I'm not sure I totally grasped the question. Uh, he saw them as two independent bodies. All of the Twelve joined the Council of Fifty. Uh, and um, so he, he doesn't see the count. He sees them as operating, I think, really within different realms. The Council of Fifty in the realm of politics and government and the decorum of the Twelve in the realm of ecclesiastical matters. How many names on the list of the Fifty left the church and how many were enemies to the church? It's a great question. Um, you know, I'm not totally sure. By the time of the Joseph Smith era, they're kind of fudging and there's 54 members of the council. Uh, one of the first actions they do under Brigham Young is to drop 22 members of the council. Uh, they drop Sidney Rigdon and people who followed Rigdon. Uh, they drop the three non-members uh, for various uh, reasons. They don't see them as trustworthy anymore. They drop others who have come out, out in opposition to the church. So there is a significant group of that original men, uh, original 50, 
who are dropped at the beginning of the Brigham Young era of the council. Other men are then added uh, to the council, so that it always has roughly around 50 men. Why are there 54 members listed in the Council of 50? Well, they just, you know, you, there's some new people who should be admitted, and what can you do? Uh, th there's a little bit of confusion sometimes in the records whether the standing chairman and the clerk uh, should be counted as uh, in the list of 50 or not, but they saw 50 as kind of a rough guide, not, a, not an exact number. Yeah, so, so there's a question here, were there other besides LDS in the original 50? There are these three non-Mormons. Uh, they're not exactly the most distinguished uh, people you would ever uh, meet in your life, uh, but, but they're people who have shown some friendliness uh, to, to the Mormons in Nauvoo, and they don't really play that active of a role in the council, and I, th I think uh, Joseph sees their role almost as symbolic as saying, in the kingdom of God, it's not just Mormons. So were the Whistlers and Whittlers 12-year-olds with pocket knives or 20-year-olds with Bowie knives? Well, the, this was an era in which deacons were generally men in their 20s and 30s. These are not 12-year-olds, uh, notwithstanding what you may have read in The Friend over time. Uh, it's, it's, it, these are grown men. Are the minutes images available online? Uh, they will be. Uh, so uh, uh, probably within about a year of the publication of the book, so next fall we'll put the minutes uh, images online. Let's see. How are we doing, Scott? Do the minutes add insights to the challenges of the women of Nauvoo? I wonder about Emma Smith and her role or lack thereof after the killing uh, of Joseph Smith. You know, there, there just really isn't much in the minutes that would uh, add to our knowledge uh, of Emma Smith. Certainly, you, you see some of the fallout that happens uh, afterwards uh, in, in uh, the minutes. Um, but the, uh, Emma Smith is mentioned one time in the minutes, and she's actually the only woman mentioned uh, in the minutes. So the, those looking for insights and that question, um, we, we always have trouble including uh, a lot of women in the Joseph Smith papers because of the nature of the documents, and this volume is particularly bad that way. Does the council meet again after January 1846? Yes. Uh, so the council meets at winter quarters on a handful of occasions. They then meet uh, in Salt Lake uh, between about 1848 and 1851, 1848, 1849. The council in a lot of ways is acting as the governmental body uh, in Salt Lake. This is before the organization of the territory. There's a very kind of small revival of the council in 1867. They just came to kind of convene and add a few members. Uh, then in, the 18, in 1880, John Taylor, who of course is a very active member of the council uh, with Joseph Smith, reconvenes the council and it operates from about 1880 uh, to 1885. Uh, the council uh, then uh, doesn't meet uh, again uh, in its history. Uh, how have the Joseph Smith papers made a positive influence to our understanding of uh, church history? Uh, you know, I, I, I think there's lots of ways. I think, I think we understand that the Joe Smith papers are not going to be read uh, by the vast uh, majority of church members. They're kind of big. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, it was made very clear to the Joe Smith paper staff early on that the, that the vision of the papers was to be written to scholars, that the audience was academics, so that books so that it would, they, they would have credibility uh, to academics around the world. And we think we've achieved that, uh, but we're also interested in having the books influence understanding of church history to, to average members. And so we do try to work uh, 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 in various ways to uh, have that happen. Uh, uh, with other people in the church history department, we've written a series of articles called Revelations in Context that 
give the story, the backstory of each section of the Doctrine and Covenants using insights from the Joseph Smith Papers. Uh, insights from the Joseph Smith Papers were also integrated into the section headings of the Doctrine and Covenants in 2013, and we've tried to work with our, our friends in, in, in the curriculum department and, and, and seminaries and institutes uh, so that they have the best historical information uh, to work with as well. 50% of the kingdom of God, or of any kingdom, are women. Is there any indication that the Council of 50 had any intention of having women serve and the government of the proposed theodemocracy? Uh, you know, I think it's just a question that, that they didn't consider. Uh, I think we're just, they're just in a different era, and that, that question, as far as I know, doesn't come up, uh, certainly doesn't come up in the minutes, and there's no indication that it comes up uh, in their thoughts for what the Council of 50 is at that moment. Trying to get as many of these as I can. Okay, right. Is there a what? I, I didn't hear you. No, I, I heard it, I heard it. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't know if there was a secret member of the camp. <laughs> No, I mean, that, the, there's no indication that the council operated after 1885. Uh, so, um, one question, can you tell us a little bit about the three non-members who are on the Council of 50, how they feel about being part of it? You know, w there's no actual records left from these three men that would comment on their uh, participation with the council. What is the most interesting thing you discovered uh, while writing the Council of 50 Minutes? I'll just say that for me as a historian, Working with the Council of 50 Minutes was terrific. Uh, there's very few opportunities to be able to look at a record and work on a record that hasn't been looked at before and hasn't been worked on uh, before. And I think for me, um, so some of what I've, I've highlighted here is what I, what I really enjoyed. I, these discussions that they have in the Council in April 1844, uh, the way they organize the Council is they all sit in a semicircle no, so, sorry, they sit in a circle, Joseph at the head, the oldest member of the council to his immediate right, and so on around the circle. And the idea is that every man will have the chance to speak in the council. So for instance, when Joseph raises the question, is there a distinction between the church of God and the kingdom of God, he turns to his right, and Samuel Bent, the oldest man of the council, is supposed to speak first. So imagine ward council with 50 people in the room, and everyone's supposed to go around the circle and say something, right? These meetings are all-day meetings, and William Clayton just kept terrific minutes. So you just have such a window onto what they were thinking, what they thought about the U.S. Constitution, what they thought about uh, a, a divine constitution. What, just all these kind of theoretical the debates they're having were really interesting. It was fascinating to me that Joseph lets them all speak, kind of getting wisdom from the group, and then at the end, he explains, this is how I see it. Uh, and, 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 and so that was um, really uh, interesting to me. I will mention, um, I brought a number of these pamphlets. There's about 50 sitting. Uh, they were at the auction table, but they've probably been moved. But they're back there. We'll find them. Uh, th this highlights what we've done with the Church Historians Press this year. It has the first uh, minutes of the Council of 50 that have been available. So there's a minute... Uh, day's discussion in here. There's also uh, excerpts from the first 50 years of Relief Society from Joseph Smith Papers, Documents 4, which uh, the excerpt is about the calling of the original 12. And then there's uh, journal uh, excerpts from the George Q. Cannon Journal. Uh, that's such a foundational source in Latter-day Saint history that, again, it's never been available, but that's being uh, published online. So I think, uh, I think we should let people eat. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, man.